Good morning, church. My name is Shane, and it's my absolute joy to welcome you to church today. We are going to worship our amazing God. We're going to pray to Him as well. And then in a little while, I've got a, a few things from the life of our church that I'd love to share with you. I'd also love to give you a bit of a heads up that we're going to share in the gift of communion today. So you may like to take a moment to prepare for that if you haven't already done so. Uh, as well as all of that, we're going to hear from one of our pastors today, Pastor Dave. I forget which one. Uh, I'm just joking. We're going to hear from uh, Pastor Dave Gillett as he brings us uh, the final message in the series that we've been looking at of Cultivate. So I'm really keen to hear what Pastor Dave has for us this morning. I'd like to take a moment just in advance to really thank our worship team for, for all that they do. And they're going to lead us uh, in a, into a place where we just have that opportunity to forget about some of the distractions in life and really focus in on what it is the Spirit of God has for us today. Thanks, team.
Stealing 
Let's bow our heads and pray together, church. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your goodness. You're a good, good Father. And we thank you, Lord, that you allow us not to reap just what we sow, but what you sow, God. And it's so good. It's who you are. And you have never failed us yet. We thank you for that, God. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. If you're just joining us this morning, I'd love to welcome you to church today and just let you know that we are going to be celebrating the gift of communion today. So if you're not prepared for that, you may like to take a moment. One of the things I love about Bendigo Baptist Church is the diversity of our people. We have old people and young people. Uh, we've got average blokes like me and we've even got a real life celebrity. You may have seen the Bendigo Advertiser this week or you may have seen our, uh, our family segment that Brock and Jackie shared and uh, you might know but you may not. We have uh, in our church a gentleman by the name of Mr. Harold Toma, who on Tuesday of this week celebrated a really significant milestone. Uh, Mr. Toma has been around our church just for a little while, and this week he celebrated his 104th birthday. That's right, 104. Mr. Toma, we hope you've had a really special week, and we thank you for your contribution to our church family and to the broader community, and we wish you much joy. Speaking of joy, how much joy do you think you could get out of a, a basic shoebox like this? How much uh, love do you think you could squish into a simple shoebox like this? One of the great opportunities that we have every year here at Bendigo Baptist Church is to take part uh, in blessing children in need by participating in Operation Christmas Child. And this year is no different in that. We'd love to invite you to take part. Um, Operation Christmas Child exists to bless children all over the world with gifts that they may not receive otherwise at Christmas time. It's a superb way for us to share the love of Jesus. Let's take a peek at what it looks like. My name is Bote. I'm eight years old. I like pink color. When I grow up, I want to be TikTok. This is my home. And these gifts come from people that love you, and they want you to know Jesus Christ. We want the children of the world to know what Christmas is all about, that God gave His Son, Jesus Christ, for the sins of this world. And it's an incredible gift. And so you think, well, God, does it really mean that much? It means everything in the world. Be when I open, I get a book and the, the door and I get this in my book. ខ្ញុំបាទខ្ញុំមានសេចក្តីត្រេចអនឹងរីករាយណាស់ដែលកូនបានមកវិញណាស់ហើយមានតាំងកណ្ដូរបាទមានតាំងកណ្ដូស្
Let's pray. Sovereign Father, as we continue to see an impact all around us as a result of COVID-19, we pray with our brothers and sisters everywhere for your hand over this situation, Lord. Lord, you know of the many, many ways that people are impacted by this. And we unashamedly ask you, Father, today to heal this situation. We think of Psalm 107, Lord, and we know that you delight in delivering your people. We faithfully believe, Lord, that this will be no different. And we trust that you have this situation in hand. We believe, Lord, that you take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it to good. We've seen you do that in many different ways, God, and we thank you. We pray today that in your time and in your way, you will take COVID-19 away. God, this morning I pray for your church as we come together from all over the place to hear your living word. We pray for Pastor Dave as he shares with us this morning, Lord. We pray that through your Holy Spirit, you will guide Pastor Dave. And we pray that as we receive your message this morning, you will help each of us to see that it's not just a message for our ears, Lord, but a message for our lives. And we pray together in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Shane. And uh, hello to, to you all. Good to see you all. Uh, pardon the pun. But uh, as we open up our Bibles together to uh, Galatians 5 again, and Colossians as well, we're going to have read for us in a moment. I want to give you an opportunity to, to give now. There's a little slide appearing on the screen that lets you know the ways in which you can give. And uh, As a group of people, of God's people, we are conscious that everything we have comes from him and we worship him in, uh, in, as, in our giving. And so uh, take the opportunity to do that now and grab your Bibles and open up and we'll have that passage read for us. Galatians 5, 22 to 26. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Colossians 3, 1-3 since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden in Christ with God. Thank you, Michaela. Okay, we're going to dive into um, this passage together as we finish this series on the fruit of the Spirit. And as we have gone through this series, we've seen that the fruit of the Spirit, and it is, it is singular, it is all part of living by the Spirit. As we cultivate conditions for God's Spirit to dominate our lives, the pattern of our lives will look like the fruit of the Spirit that we've looked at in verses 22 and 23. And as we come to the end of this section here, and in verses 24 through to 26, there is a key idea that Paul finishes with that is essential to us walking or living or being led by God's Spirit, those three uh, descriptors that were given here in, in this passage. And, and that idea comes in verse 24. And we read there, Paul says, Those who belong to Christ, Jesus, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And so following on from Paul's comments in verses 16 to 21, about the flesh, Paul comes back to it in verse 24. And I just want to remind us what we're thinking of as we, as we speak about the flesh. It's our natural human condition of wanting to make ourselves God in our own lives for self or, or me to rule in, in our little part of the universe. And, and Paul takes aim at this again and he, and he gives us guidance for, for what it looks like to engage in this battle and, and I think we need to 
uh, take it seriously today and we need to see this clearly as we look as we end this series crucified why does Paul use this word well in Paul's day in the Roman world it was it was of course the one of the common methods of putting people to death it was a painful method it was a good method of killing people and um, and as we've read through the Gospels we have found that that's what happened to Jesus he was crucified on a Roman cross and and Paul wants us to understand that part of belonging to Jesus is that we put to death our, our willful and wayward self a sin essentially we we nail it to the cross and uh, and leave it there in the words of Romans 6 and verse 11 it becomes dead to us and we treat it that way as we belong to Christ that's the way we treat sin as being dead to us and in essence this is simply Paul's more graphic description for repentance another word that you will have read often in the Gospels of of, um, of turning away from something and turning back to something else and as Jesus uses it he means turning away from our old life and turning to follow him wholeheartedly and um, and Jesus uses this sort of language very similar language to what Paul's using here in uh, in Mark chapter 8 and verse 34 he says if anyone would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me and Paul puts it more plainly in Romans 8 13 and he speaks of putting to death the the old self and uh, I guess we, we need to understand that it, it's a it's a real thing that that we are being called to as, as believers I, imagine for a moment I, you may have heard before <laughs> as I've been speaking uh, that I like cakes oh, I like bakeries and uh, imagine for a moment uh, I don't anticipate it's happening just at the moment but uh, imagine I decided that I was going to not have them anymore no more bakeries uh, no more cakes I was going to call that treat that as being dead and um, the, the way for me to do that is to is to act as if they had no influence on me that, that they weren't there that they just weren't an option for me in the language of what's being spoken of here we we crucify the flesh by treating it as if we have no relationship to it anymore we uh, treat it as gone and dead but there is something that we we don't want to miss here though you see this crucifying is not something that is done to us but it is something that's done by us you see the grammar there in that verse and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh that's speaking of of us who belong and um, it is us taking action and so we are showing that we belong to Christ and are living by the Spirit as we deliberately take action against sin and its expression in our lives and we need to take this language of Paul seriously it's it's upheaval it's confrontation that must come for everybody who is serious about following Jesus and my burden today is as I seek to explain this passage for you and to and to help you and under the inspiration of God my burden is to help us feel the impact of that confrontation and upheaval maybe it's for the first time that that you are confronted by this this call of the gospel to to holiness or or maybe it's in some fresh way and I've got to say honestly for you that burden comes from my own experience over many years of following Jesus now and there's two things I've I've noticed for myself firstly I'm easily inclined to explain away or to think lightly of or or minimize in some way my own sinful attitudes and actions I recognize that and and I also find myself sitting under God's conviction for sin that that happens often and I feel it keenly and I and I'm convinced of the action I need to take with it and then following on from that I, I find that I'm I'm struggling to deal with it as decisively as I as I wanted to 
and I even relent of dealing with it at times. And so I, I come to you today with this burden out of my own personal experience, but also knowing that it is something which, which is there for all of us as we seek to live by the Spirit. And so as we think about this, we need to understand this is capital punishment language. I put it like that so that it might grab our attention. Uh, and we need it to jolt us. If we think, it, if we think about it in terms that, that we could identify with today, you know, this is not coming to some sort of treaty or agreement about how sin will behave in our lives now that, now that we're following Jesus. No, this is, this is not using handcuffs and restraining our sin a bit. This is not using pepper spray to, to stun our sin and, and keep it quiet for a while. This is not even using a taser gun, bang, to, to incapacitate sin for a while. This is not sending our sin to prison so that it may be rehabilitate, rehabilitated somehow and come back a bit better. No, this is lethal force. This is banging nails into it up on that cross and walking away and leaving it there to die. Now, crucifixion was, was painful. And there is no doubt that putting nails in all the various facets of sin in our lives and, and walking away from them is painful. It, it is hard. I, I wouldn't want to diminish that for a moment. And, and I... I I, I readily acknowledge that we, that we feel the pull back to our sin. And, and I don't want to deny the pain and, and difficulty at all. But, but the reality is that, that if we are to be able to walk by the Spirit, part of it is being able to take this decisive action with our sin. You know, that, that metaphor of crucifixion that Paul uses here, it's helpful for us. Crucifixion was a, a slow and, and painful, a gradual death. And it's the same for us dealing with our sin. As we come to faith in Christ and we repent of our sin and nail it to the cross, the forgiveness we receive and the release from condemnation is complete. It's absolutely sufficient for, for all our past, our present and our future sin. And God looks at us and he proclaims us righteous. He views us as right with him. But there's no sense in which our human experience of it all is done and dealt with in that moment. And there's nothing more for us to do. You know, continuing to crucify our sin as we go on in life and we become more and more aware of it will be something we do in the power of God's Spirit for the rest of our days. It, you know, why else would Jesus teach us to pray continually, forgive us our sins? as we forgive those who sin against us. I think it's clear from the New Testament that day by day we demonstrate that we have crucified our sin decisively at conversion by going on killing it in our lives as it presents itself day by day. You see, the reality of our humanity is that we understand ourselves to a greater degree as we go through life. We, we understand more of who we are as we, as we go on in life. And also, as humans, we become more and more exposed as we navigate the different stages and experiences of life. Who we are and what makes us up and our character becomes more evident as we go through the different stages of life. Oh, I've got to say for, for myself, I, I became a Christian somewhere in my teenage years and, and I... I brought my sin to God repeatedly in those times. I confessed it to him. I repented of it. And, um, and I believed that it was dealt with. No dramas. But as I went on through my, uh, through my 20s and through my 30s and now in my 40s, I, find, I have found that in the different experiences of life, more and more of who I am, more and more of my capacity to sin, more and more of my, my own nature that wants to well up and pull me away from God becomes evident in those different situations. And I think that's the same for all of us. Now, there is, there is heartache in us. 
needing to continue to put that sin to death. But I just want to say there's, there's relief as well. Relief that we are not on our own in this. As I mentioned at the start of this series, there is this New Testament balance between what has been done for us, the indicative, and, and what we are doing, the, the imperative. And, and we see that in the reading we had from Colossians chapter 3 there, uh, verses 2 and 3. Listen to verse 2. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. That's, that's imperative language. And then verse 3, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. That's indicative language. Our life is hidden with Christ. That's what God is doing for us. And so there is relief in that we are not on our own. I want to also say there's relief in that as we actively participate in what God is doing in our lives, we are showing that we belong to him. The reality of our continuing to put sin to death in our lives is not indicating that we're doing a bad job necessarily of following Jesus or that we are defeated in that, but that God's spirit is active in our lives. And actually, one of the marks of Christian maturity that's been attested to by great numbers of people over the years is that as they've grown in holiness they've become more and more aware of sin in their lives. I've heard a number of people close to the end of their lives who love Jesus with a passion and earnestness that is inspiring and all of them reflect that as they've grown closer and closer to God they've, they've felt more and more keenly their own sinfulness. I guess by way of illustration... One of, one of my children, um, she, and I guess I'm giving it away there, she, uh, she used to have a bedroom that looked like a tip. There would constantly be stuff thrown all over the floor, clothes, pillows, uh, bed coverings, uh, all sorts of stuff. It was all over the floor in a horrible mess. And uh, a little while back, um, she decided that she wanted to change that. And uh, there was an incentive there and she wanted to have a continually clean and tidy bedroom. And so she has set about doing that. And as she's done it day by day and week by, month, week by, <laughs> week, by week and month by month, it, the, the strange thing that you notice is that where before you might never have noticed the odd sock or you know a bit of a, a, a sweet wrapper or, or some other bit of clothing just laying on the floor because it was one amongst many others, now she walks into the bedroom and she sees a sock or something and she notices it and she picks it up and she deals with it. Do you see what's happening there? As she's cleaned her room up, she suddenly realises the, the little bits and pieces that, that are there to be picked up. And it's the same for us. As we go on and we grow in maturity in Jesus Christ, it becomes more and more evident for us. God exposes for us and shows us and reveals to us where, where he wants to work and the sin that he wants to uproot in our lives. And so Paul says in verse 24, you've crucified the flesh, continue to do it. And then in, in verse 25... Just briefly, we've looked at this plenty through this series, but he goes on to say, uh, walk by the Spirit. I'm still back in Colossians. I was wondering what I was looking at. Uh, verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. That, that word walk there is the Greek word stoikio. It's a slightly different Greek word to what is up in verse 16. And it means to walk in line with or to be in line with. And, and here, that line, that standard, is the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit leads us and we walk according to his rule. And so what verse 24 and verse 25 together emphasise is coming back to what Paul had for us in verses 16 to 21. And that is, the shape of the Christian life is walking in line with God's Spirit and as we do, actively putting off or rejecting all that wants to pull us away from God. And so I want to finish today by, by trying to think about, well, what does this look like practically? 
we've seen that as we've gone through that the evidence of God's spirit at work in us is, is the fruit that he, he displays. Uh, but as we think about this walking by the spirit, as we think about crucifying the flesh, what does it look like for us practically? You might think, well, this is just spiritual stuff. What, what can we do practically? And I want to give you seven things. And when, when you get to number six, you know, we're, we're nearly there. But I just want to give them to you, and, and I hope they might be helpful for you. The, the first thing that I think is, is really good for us is to find ways to impress on ourselves how sin breaks the heart of God, how it breaks relationship with him. The pain it causes him to see us, and that's his precious created beings designed to reflect who he is. The pain it causes him to see us treating the thing that has made a mess of his world and humanity like it's just a little trifling thing that doesn't really matter very much. Sin really matters to God. And part of the way we start to deal with it is to keep on impressing ourselves to it, to us how sin breaks the heart of God. Secondly, I think we need to understand that, that we be thankful and praise God and celebrate that Jesus Christ has died in our place for our sin. That really makes a difference for us. It's real. And that fact alone changes our whole relationship to sin. In him, we are no longer slaves to sin. We are no longer under its condemnation. And we say hallelujah and we celebrate that. We remind ourselves of it. We praise God for it. At the end of this time, we're going to uh, share in communion together. And in doing that, we're going to, we're going to celebrate that again. That, that Christ has done it for us. It's not something we're trying to do ourselves, but, but Christ has done it for us. We have, we have freedom from sin with Jesus Christ. Thirdly, be real about our sin. Be real about our sin. Ask God to reveal it to you. And, and be honest with yourself. Don't try and skate over it. You know, if you're having trouble trying to work it out for yourself, well, ask somebody else. <laughs> There'll be a few people around that will be able to help you. Uh, maybe it's a sibling. If I know anything about what it was like to be a brother or sister or I see my children in action, uh, a sibling will certainly be able to help you understand a little bit of, of your sin. Uh, maybe it's a husband or, or wife. Um, lots of truth there. Uh, maybe it's another Christian who knows you well. But, but be real about your sin and try and understand it for what it is. Donna talked about this last week with faithfulness and integrity. And God never means that as Christians we just give ourselves a, a new paint job with some, with some new habits of behaviour to look good on the outside. In Christ we, we are a new creation. Not to hypocritically hide our sin and to push it away into some dark corner somewhere that nobody's going to see anymore, but still is going to be there. No, to, to be real about it and to leave it behind. So thirdly, be real about our sin. Fourthly, keep on reminding and declaring to yourself that you belong to Jesus. As you do, Work at developing habits of your minds and thoughts that keep directing you to God rather than away from him. And so Colossians 3, 2 there, set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Actively set your mind there. I don't know about you, but mine, my mind just drifts all over the place um, at times. When I'm trying to pray, my mind is drifting. When I'm driving, my mind is drifting. When I'm wandering around the backyard doing some jobs, my mind is drifting. And, and there's nothing wrong with that in, in many cases. But God says, look, keep directing your mind to him. Maybe it's some sort of hymn, maybe it's some sort of prayer, maybe it's some sort of thankfulness. I don't know what it is, but keep on finding ways to direct your mind to God. Philippians 4.8 echoes the same thing. Whatever's true, honourable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, worthy of praise. Think about these things. Keep on reminding and declaring to yourself that you belong 
to Jesus. Fifthly, take the trouble to understand and be realistic about the world and the culture in which we live. Work out how it might be pulling you away from God. Work out how it might be tempting you. Work out how it might be taking your mind elsewhere and, and stop that happening. Don't let it pull you away from God. In Jesus' words, be in the world but not of the world. Be realistic about the world and culture in which we live. Sixthly, that one, don't give sin an opportunity in your life. Don't give sin an opportunity in your life. Just be, recognise this, be aware that we can feel the pull back to our sin. Maybe we find some comfort in it somehow. We may even find ourselves trying to take it down from the cross and, and give it a bit of first aid, maybe a bit of CPR and, and bring it back to life somehow. Don't be taken in by its deceits and manipulations. And, and that can happen for us very easily. It can happen to us if we're arrogant how, about how we won't be affected by it anymore. Um, or it can happen as we, we are curious to see how close we can get to the edge in a sense, to see if sin will still affect us in some way. You know, something like trying to prove your self-control by starting an argument with a member of your family, hoping they will lose the plot while you stay gloriously calm and self-righteous. <laughs> or, or maybe it's testing to see how much um, you, you can resist the pull of material things and to do that you say oh, okay I'm gonna I'm gonna spend a day uh, going for a spot of window shopping maybe it's the marketplace or maybe it's online and uh, I'm just gonna see how much I can resist the pull of material things on my life D don't give sin an opportunity in your life be real about its deceits and manipulations and finally number seven Fight sin in your life with a passion. And, and as I say this, I feel greatly challenged by this because I, I find it difficult to do. I, I, I hear the quote, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Uh, but the reality is that, that Jesus calls us to take up our cross and to follow him. We're, we're urged here to, to crucify our sin. And that must mean something for the way we approach it. And we have to approach it ruthlessly. Jesus says to us, he uses language of gouging out our eyes or cutting off our hands if things cause us to sin, if they cause us to sin. And effectively, he's saying, be really decisive with it. Don't mess around with it. You know, if you're facing temptation, praying for God to take it away for you is, is just the beginning. And too often that's where we stop and, it, and it's not enough. We, we need to be more aggressive with ourselves in so many of these suggestions, or these situations, sorry. And uh, I just want to um, refer to a, a little devotion book. It's by John Piper that I read a few years back and I was really struck by uh, one of his devotions here and, and it brought this home for me and, and he speaks about purity and he speaks about the, the battle that that is for us and, and he says, look, for instance here, if we're thinking about battling sin, this is what he says, what, what this means for us, if we are really going to battle it in this case, is that we must not give a, a sexual image that he's speaking of in this case or, or an impulse more than five seconds before we start to attack it back with our mind. In other words, it's as soon as we feel it coming, coming at us and affecting us, we're, we're pushing back with our minds and, and maybe we're saying something, no, get out of my head, I don't want to think about you anymore. But, but then he goes on to say, but it doesn't stop there. It doesn't even stop with saying, God, will you please take this away from me? And, and perhaps we walk away from whatever that, wherever that image is so we don't see it anymore. He says, no, it doesn't even stop there. 
He said the real battle begins as we try and replace that image in our mind with something else. And he says, what do we do? Well, we've got to, we've got to fight. We've got to, we've got to push. And he says, we've got to find another image that, that replaces it, that, that removes us from that thinking. And he suggests, you know, you might want to reckon with the reality of, of, of thinking upon the cross of Jesus Christ and Jesus on that cross. He's, you might want to think about his, his back that's been ripped to shreds for you and for your sin. You might want to think about his, his screams of pain as, it, as he suffers there as they built the nails in. You might want to think about his gasps. You might want to think about the bones and the nerves in his, in his pierced feet as they crush against each other with anguish. You might want to think about the crown of thorns on his head as he leans his head back against the cross to get relief from his pain. That crown of thorns juts into his skull again and, and it bites him all over again. And he goes on to say, you start pushing those images into your mind and whatever image of sexuality is finds it pretty hard to exist there as you forcefully and willfully exert and push that image into your mind. No, those two images are not compatible. And then he says this, and I thought this was really good. If you will use the muscle of your brain to pursue, to violently pursue with the muscle of your mind, images of Christ, in the words of Philippians 4 and verse 8, things that are good and, and excellent and, and praiseworthy and whatever it might be in this relation, but with the same creative energy that you use to pursue whatever other things you may have on your mind, you will kill them. But it must start quickly. And you must really work at it. For me, that was compelling in a whole lot of things. It, it's not just praying, God, will you help me, and then sitting back passive. No, we've got to reckon with the battle that is there for us to, to face, to crucify the flesh. Seven things. I'm sure there are many more but I hope they are seven helpful things for you. Now, as I emphasise our action in pursuing holiness like this and talk about fighting sin, I'm mindful that people could say it sounds an awful lot like religion. In fact, it's been publicly commented that we are fostering religiosity here at BBC and, and this could be seen as another example. But I think that confuses what religion is. It would be religious if we are thinking in terms of earning God's favour by what we do or don't do. But this is not what this is at all. This is receiving God's undeserved favour or his grace and showing that reality in our lives by rejecting the rule of sin and living under the rule of God's spirit. This is having the courage to hold on to the New Testament balance between grace and works, what's been done for us, and what we're doing in cooperation with that. And so we hear Paul's words at the end of Galatians chapter 5. If we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. Let's pray and ask God to help us as we seek to do that wholeheartedly. Father, we thank you for your word we thank you for your truth. And Father, as we, as we think about this, I pray that you would just be at work by your spirit. I pray that you would impress yourself on our hearts. I pray that you would be grabbing a hold of our minds and showing us, convicting us, leading us by your spirit. And give us courage to do what we need to negatively in what we're putting aside, positively in what we're grabbing hold of and setting our minds on, to be able to walk by the Spirit. Father, we thank you and we, we thank you that all this is possible in Jesus Christ. And uh, I pray that as we come now to, to remember what he has done for us, you would, uh, you'd be at work in us. We, we thank you that you've given us this simple remembrance this reminder of the, the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. And as, as we celebrate and remember together, I, I pray that you would uh, you'd impress yourself on us. 
whether that's for the, the first time or the, the thousandth time, I, I ask that you'd make yourself real to us at this time. Father, I, I thank you again for our Saviour Jesus. I thank you that you live in us by your Spirit. And I pray that would be evident in our lives by the fruit, by what we're leaving behind, by what we're walking towards. And so I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to eat and drink together. We come in this simple meal as people who love God and want to love him more. And we come to simply remember who Jesus is for us, what he has done for us. He is giving himself for us. And uh, today, as we reflect on Galatians 5 and walking by the Spirit, uh, this is a good opportunity just to bring ourselves before God, to confess our sin, to ask him to give us courage to, to deal with it in the power of his Spirit. Let's uh, take and, and eat and drink together. And uh, we pray this is to the glory of God. Thanks so much for that, Dave. Church, as we move into a new week, uh, I pray that you've been really inspired and encouraged today. And I pray that as a church, we continue to just encourage each other towards spiritual maturity. We'd love to invite you to connect with us. And there's a couple of ways to do that. So if you're watching us through the Facebook feed, uh, you can go into the, the, set, the comment section and type in the word connect, and we'll be in touch with you through that. Uh, otherwise, you can send us an email to connect at bendigobaptist.org.au. We'd love to hear from you, and uh, please send us an email there. Church, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Have a great day and a great week ahead. God bless you.